Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of this tonight. Good evening. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. God bless you abundantly. How is your day going? Hey, all shall be well. You may not know how, and you may not know when, but he will do it again. God will do it again. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so, so very much. You are all very special to me. You're all very important to me. And I'm so honored to be hosting all of you tonight. It is going to be amazing. It is going to be great tonight. So please share the link. Invite someone because, ooh, my guest tonight is one of the best, you know. <laughs> you all know. You can smell something good already. So, what is my opening remark tonight? Hmm, hmm, hmm. My opening remark tonight. Know when to stop. Hmm. Know when to stop. That's my opening remark tonight. Know when to stop. And I'm going to share personal experience very shortly. A lot of you, you are burning out because you don't know when to stop. You cannot please everybody. You cannot win everybody. You cannot win the world. You are not sent to everybody. Know when to stop. God forbid, if you kill yourself because of people, they will move on to another person. You are alive. You see the way they are even still behaving. Not to talk of if you kill yourself for them. Know when to stop. You cannot continue to sow time, money, energy, affection, love, this and that to people that are not responding to you. You cannot continue to try to buy love to try and make sure that, hey, I don't want him to be angry. I don't want her to be, you know, and all that. People that don't even have time for you. And you keep killing yourself because of them. You cannot win everybody. You cannot please everybody. You need in your life quality people, not only quantity. So the relationships that God has blessed you with understand how to nurture those relationships with honor, with time, with dignity. But please, I beg of you, know when to stop. Let me share this with you. There was a time, a season in my life, because life is not lived in years, it is lived in seasons. When I traversed, I traveled everywhere with the vision of Mother's Summit. Mother's Summit is a prayer meeting for mothers and mothers-to-be. And I did that for about 11 years. I went to different countries and different cities and different places. But I understood this thing that I'm talking to you about, and I still understand it, that you must know not only what God said, but what God is saying. What God is saying. I knew when that assignment changed. I knew it. I understood it. I'm so grateful to God now that everybody has caught fire, you know. We have different kinds of summits here. People are praying for their children. So many things are happening today. I thank God for that. But you see, I knew when to stop. I knew when my assignment changed. You cannot just sit down with something and say as it was in the beginning, so shall it be life without end. And you are dying. And you are wasting money. And you are losing money. And you are losing yourself. And you are losing your health. Know when to stop. That's my opening remarks tonight. Know when to stop. Whether you are a pastor or you are an imam, no matter who you are, please know when to stop. Know when to stop. Know when to put a comma. No one to put a full stop. Yes. No one to stop. I can go on and on and on and on, but you know I'm not the guest tonight. I just need to give you that opening remark. Some of you, let me say this. 
Anytime you ask God for more, God will ask you for structure. Where is the structure? You get millions and millions and millions and you just waste on an assignment that has expired. That God expected you, but by now you should have moved to something else, something new. And you still sit down there and that's what you are still spending money on. Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom is the principal thing. Know when to stop. Know when to stop. God bless you. Welcome tonight. It's an honor for me to be hosting this beautiful queen. Oh, Pastor Mildred. Ooh, 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 ooh. You all know that tables will be shattered today. <laughs> So, we're going to have her share with us. You know here, I bring people that are... Oh, she's here. See the queen, see the queen, see the queen. Oh, okay. <laughs> what a beautiful lady. What a befitting queen. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for doing this with me tonight. Hi, speaking. Hi, the children. Hi. Yeah, very well, ma. My absolute pleasure, ma. My Thank absolute, you. very honored to be here. It's so very much. So everybody will have the coin in the house. Pastor Mildred, Kingsley Okonkwo, she's going to be a blessing to us. You know that when I say navigate with FFA, all I have in mind is to bring people that are at the top or people that are on their way to the top to pull back the curtains and share with us. Because I know that success leaves cues. And I know that nobody succeeds accidentally. So I'm going to yield the floor to her now. And we want to know from the remotest past, before you became Pastor Mildred, because you became, before you became a mother, a famous woman of God, shattering tables everywhere. <laughs> who lived? <laughs> it's Mildred and I'm not likely to break you know to interrupt you just go flow as the Lord leads you the floor is yours please thank you so much my such an honor to be here um honestly <laughs> when you sent me that message I was first like oh IG live <laughs> I'm, I'm always on IG live but people don't know that I rarely do IG lives you know, that everybody, mom, when mama calls, of course, I can't say no. Um, and of course, we're in the middle of a tour and all that, you know, getting ready to go home and all that. Um, so who is Mildred? <sighs> I will start from the very beginning. Um, Mildred, born Mildred Isioma Chijide, born into a family of six children. Um, I was the baby for five years until one day my mom came home with another child and I was wondering what's going on and somehow all the affection and all the attention well maybe not all but you know in a five-year-old's mind <laughs> all the affection seemed to have moved to her um and then I think at that point was when um I think Satan now started trying to get a hold of my mind you know making me feel like you're not important anymore you're not the baby anymore you're not so special anymore and so at that point, from that point on, I believe I started dealing with um, self-esteem issues. And tonight I'm going to try to be as vulnerable as possible because I believe that there are people who only see the Mildred on stage and they don't know what has happened before I had to get to this point. Um, can you hear me? People are saying they can't hear me. We now. can hear you clearly. Maybe it's from... So um, my dad, my dad was... A, uh, a banker can't even believe I'm talking about him in past years. my dad was a banker um, my mom was a teacher and, and they were very hands on parents I also grew up in a family where my dad was very sacrificial so he was the kind of person that believed in helping everyone um, and in my opinion if you ask me um, probably to his own detriment as well because I think my dad would have been wealthier than he was um, but he spent all all of his time, his energy and everything, trying to help everyone else around him. Uh, my mom also, we always had people in our home. You know, I grew up in a, I grew up with five siblings. However, I don't really think I grew up with five siblings because we always had cousins around or our friends were always in the house. Our home was very open. 
So one of the things my parents taught us was generosity and being sacrificial. So growing up, I grew up in a Catholic home. So my parents were both Catholic, um, but I always, always hungered for God. At a very tender age, I, I was the one who asked all the questions, you know, um, why do we pray to Mary? Why is God called our Heavenly Father? Who is our Heavenly Mother? Um, I was very curious as a child. And my mom noticed that. And so what she, she started doing for me was that she taught me to read. So I started reading early. And my mom opened me to the world of books. So I read everything I could find. I was a reader, a very voracious reader. And even as a small, young child, I would read books that were too heavy for me to carry. And my mom really, she was an English teacher, so she really, really fed that. Um, she made sure I read as much as I could. Um, growing up then, of course, Kafka's in classes, I would ask questions. I always asked questions. So my hunger for God and my love for God didn't start today. I always wanted to know more i knew there was more i knew i just knew there was something inside me that just wanted more i just wanted more i felt like i needed a deeper relationship with god and what i had been given was pray your rosary wear your scapula and do all of that and so i did it religiously but i still felt like there was more i felt like i needed more there was an emptiness and i kept asking questions i got into secondary school i went to command so my primary school I was i went to corona papa from Corona Papa, I went to Command Secondary School in Baja. I was a boarding student. Got into Command, and I was really shocked because growing up, we were what you call a mugget inside. My parents sheltered us, <laughs> really sheltered us. So I, I never really understood, um, you know, needing something and not being given that thing, or having to struggle for something or anything. we literally we grew up pampered. So I got to boarding school, and I think my parents sent us to boarding school to be toughened. So all of us went to boarding school, except my younger sister. Um, we went, or, um, got into boarding school, um, military school. <laughs> so rude shock. Um, from having everything done for you, you wake up in the morning, they bathe you, they rush you, they do this, that, to if you hear people say nasty things, like if your father... If you know your father is a lizard, I'm counting five for you. Or if your mother, if they born your mother, no, those kind of things, I was really shocked. <laughs> I'm like, is this real life? What's going on here, you know? Then they would punish us, tell us to crawl, tell us to do frog jump, all kinds of things that I couldn't relate to. It's like, like why? Why are, we pun why are you punishing us? What did you, you know? Um, they would flog us with belts, all kinds of things. So it was a horrible experience for me. I was literally <laughs> traumatized. And all this while, um, remember I said I was already dealing with self-esteem issues um, and then being in a school where seniors were mean, everything was, they were bullying you, they would lock us inside toilets, tell us to pound poo, poo you know, all kinds of nasty things, go and push dustbin at the back. It was a horrible experience. And of course, one thing I learned in that season, and like mama, as you always say, you know, life is in seasons. And that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my life is that there are always seasons of your life and you must learn to adapt to every season. So, of course, when entering into that season of your mommy and your daddy are not here, you have to adjust. So I had to toughen up. You know, seniors, of course, bullied us. We're punished. They lost a lot of nasty things. Pastor K, interestingly, went to the same secondary school with me, but he adapted a different way. He became a bad boy so that nobody... But as for me... Um, what it did was it made me more quiet and I would implode. So rather than be vocal, I would always keep everything that was going on inside me. So even going home, I wouldn't tell my parents anything. You know, how do you like school? It's okay. Um, how do you It's okay? And I just focused on my grades. Just read your books and come out, you know. So one thing that pain does for me is that it pushes me closer to God. So I started looking for God more. So um, in my SS1, um, my SS1 was about 13 years old at the time, but I was very sickly as a child. That's one thing I forgot to mention. I was very sickly as a child. Um, I had asthma growing up, a lot of things. I was very sickly, but let's not go into that. So one of those days I was very ill. 
um, and then a friend of mine came to me. I would never forget because this is my salvation experience. And I think that that's how you meet Jesus, how you encounter Jesus affects how you walk with him for the rest of your life. And so um, she walked up to me. I was lying down in the bed. I'll never forget. It was about 7 p.m. in the evening, May 24th. I was very ill. So she came to the bed and said to me, her name, her name at the time was Ben Rushon Gudimu. She said to me, um, do you know that you can be healed? And I was like, really? She said, yes, that you can be healed. It's a simple thing. I mean, she was 13 herself or 14. I think 14 because she'd be older than me. She said, just a simple thing. All I have to do is say prayer with you and you'll be healed. I was like, ah, the way I'm feeling now, anything, anything you tell me to do, I think at this point I'm going to do. And so she held my hand and said to me, the first thing is that you need to give your life to Christ. If you give your life to Christ, then your life belongs to him. And that means that everything that happens to you from here on, it matters to him because your life is no longer yours, it's his. And so I, I held her hand there and said a simple prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my heart, take over my life. And from today, everything that is mine is yours. Simple prayer. Mama, that prayer changed the whole of my life. Instantly, I was healed. Instantly. No headache, no fever, no pain, nothing. I got up from that place and ran to look for my closest friend at the time. And I said to her, something happened to me now. And you need to do the same thing. And we both held hands on the corridor of Octopus House, Command Secondary School. And I said to her, say after me, Lord Jesus, exactly what my friend had just done with me. I did with her. She gave her life to Christ. Thankfully, today she's still born again. Maybe because that was my first convert, my first, my first ministry assignment. And from that point on, I started hearing a voice inside me, in my heart. Maybe not from outside, but you know that someone is speaking to you on the inside. And I would hear things like, you are loved. You are special. I will take care of you. I would want to do my exams and I would be worried. And he would say, you have my mind. You have the mind of Christ. So these are scriptures, things I had read. Remember, mom, I said I was a reader. So things I had read, I read the Bible. So I would read the Bible and I would hear it inside my soul that you have the mind of Christ. If Christ writes an exam, will you fail? You can't fail. Don't worry, I'll take care of you. So even when I maybe say, oh, my parents are not here, something, I would hear God speak to me. And so that same gesture, I had just done my, uh, we had extension classes, we came back for our exams, and then um, I fell ill again. I had typhoid fever. So I was in the MI room. That's what our medical center was called. We were there, and um, while we were there, um, they brought a new matron. So the new matron came and said, wow, there's so many sick children here. And they were like, oh, it's exam period. Mama said, let them go home. Take them back to their parents. So they brought an ambulance and they were taking everybody home. And then the, one of the nurses there now said, no, 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 this one, she's always sick. She's not going home. It's, she won't worry. She'll be okay. The woman said, I said, let everybody go home. And they put me in. They put me in the van. Because I wasn't part of people to go home, my, my, my parents' address wasn't written down for them. So they had dropped everyone off. And then we're driving, the soldiers were driving the ambulance. And so they said, ah, you, where does your father work? Because they didn't write anything. So I, I raised my head and I said, Lagos Island, Union Bank, head office. They said, ah, that's Island. We're in the mainland, we cannot carry you. Maybe we'll carry you back to, uh, back to Ipaja. So I raised my head, mama, at that instant, they were passing my mother's school. So I said, that's my mother's school. That's my mother's school. They said, this school here. I said, yes. So they turned in. They said, what's your name? I said, Chiji Day. So they entered and they said, please, is there Mrs. Chiji Day here? The minute they came out, I had fainted. Mama, I was in a coma for seven days. I woke up after seven days. At that point, my parents had given up. They thought that the doctors had given up. They thought I was dead, everything, until my mom remembered that there was one medical, one doctor that my dad knew, Dr. Oweshika, and then they brought the man in, they brought the oxygen, did everything. And that's how I came back to life, seven days after. And when I woke up, I woke up with my mom holding my hand, praying and crying. And so when I opened my hand, she said, it's your ma, it's your ma, it's your ma, because that's my Igbo name. It's your ma, it's your ma. And I said to her, so I turned to her, and I said, what's happening? She said, hey, she said, I called everybody and they were all gathered. And so it was days later that he explained what had happened to me.
And all the while, Mama, for some weird reason, I knew that God had an assignment for me so I wasn't going to die. I didn't know what it was because I was maybe 13 or 14, but I knew that God had an assignment for me. So I knew my, my life was mapped out. Fast forward to university. I got into a Bafemi Awolo University. My dad wasn't very excited about it. He wanted me to go to Unilag and to do law, but I got into a Bafemi Awolo University to study English. Um, so the plan, according to my dad, was, okay, you do one year of English here, and then you do jump again and then change to Unilag and do law. And we all agreed. Mama, at the end of that first year, I had learned how to hear God. I had learned, so I had joined a fellowship in school and I had begun to experience church, you know, church the Pentecostal way. And so I had stayed praying in tongues. I had so everything, you know, I had literally become Christian on my own, not because my parents were Christian. And so I said, reading books like Good Morning Holy Spirit, How to Be Led by the Spirit of God by Ken Hagen and all of that. And so I started praying and God told me not to leave OAU, that there would my destiny be fulfilled. And so I failed my exam. I didn't fail, but I didn't get caught off. <laughs> my father, thank God, my father is not here. He's in heaven, he's hearing me, he's too late, he can't do anything. <laughs> but I intentionally made sure that I didn't leave it fair because God told me that there my destiny be fulfilled. Along the line, um, I, I met a lot of people who mentored me and taught me um, the, the word. Um, some, some people were there, some, someone, okay, so there's a guy called Brother Uchanya, he taught me prayer. Pastor Timmy Odejide taught me the word. He taught me, that was my first encounter with a pastor. I'd never been pastored. So that was the first person that really pastored me. Now, something happened along the way. At the point where I learned how to hear from God, and Pastor Timmy was the person who taught me how to hear from God, and I learned how to hear from God, I started recognizing that those voices, that voice that I'd always heard on the inside of me, that always gave me comfort, was God. And he started telling me clearly what he wanted to do in my life. So I knew that I was called to ministry. I knew that God was going to use me to do great things. I started seeing visions back then when I was in school, I still remember one particular vision that I saw. I was praying in sports center and God gave me this assignment that at every, I was to cross over into the day every day with him. So I would go to sports center at 11 p.m. and I would pray into 12 a.m. every day, always. So I started my morning every day getting instruction for what the day was going to be. So I didn't, I never entered the day without crossing. So midnight prayer was a standard for me, not because of the way people make midnight prayer now. Some people think that the prayer, the power is in the midnight. That's not really what it is. It's in the, the power of prayer is not in who is praying it or when you are praying it, it's in who is answering it. So it wasn't really because of that time of the day, it was when it was, was the assignment that I was given for that season. And I think God was using it to teach me consistency and discipline because my future would involve consistency and discipline. And so I would pray every morning into the, into the morning and God would speak to me and tell me. So one, one of those days when I was praying, I saw a vision and I was in a very dark place. Very, very dark. Pitch black. So dark that I couldn't see my own hand. Like when you lift your hand, you can't see yourself. You know how dark that is now. So I was there and then all of a sudden, it seemed like a light came from heaven and lit. I was holding a candle. But I didn't know that until the light hit the candle. And then from that candle I was holding, other people started coming to take light. And they would take light and give light to other people and give light to other people. And when I looked, it looked like I was standing on the stage in a stadium. And the room was full of women. And God told me, you will light many candles. But mama, to be honest, because I didn't really have female friends, I didn't have female pastors, I, didn't, I was very, I was a low ranger as in stay on your own. I'd learned to be that way because of my self-esteem issues and because of going, I just learned to be very quiet and whatever was going on in my house, keep it inside. And so I didn't think it was a possibility. I mean, God said this thing to me when I was in my year two. So imagine God telling me that I was going to do women's ministry in year two and I only started doing women's ministry in, that's about 20 years later. So it, it didn't make sense to me at the time. So when he said that to me, I just kept it in my heart, like how Mary, 
you know, when she would hear things about Jesus, she would keep it in her heart and kept it in my heart. You know, so God said showing me pictures, he would show me visions, he would show me things, and you know, I'll just pray through it. But I also understood seasons. Once again, that's important. I understood seasons. I understand that when God says something to you, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will happen at that time. And it also doesn't mean that you should make it happen. Because I always find out sometimes people will tell me, oh, God said this thing. And then they try to force it and say, it's not working. It's not working because God didn't tell you, you to go and make it happen. And so God was saying all these things to me. And I just kept it in my heart. Um, along the line in school, I one day started bleeding. I said my period just started bleeding and it wouldn't stop. And um, I went home, we were on strike. Because then we started to ask for strikes. Um, I went home, we were on strike. And then I was losing a lot of weight. And my elder sister asked me, what's wrong with you? You're weak. You're doing somehow. What's wrong with you? And so I said to her, oh, I've been on my period for three months. I said, but please don't tell mommy. <laughs> I don't even finish saying it before she shouted, mommy! If your mom wants to kill herself. So they bundled me out to the hospital. I get to the hospital. And I'm doing an ultrasound. And the doctor, is, as he's doing the ultrasound, he's doing... Mm, mm, you know, constantly shaking his head. And me, ah. so the man said to me, he said... Ah. So he called my mom in. I told my mom that uh, your daughter has PCOS, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome or something that your the problem with this thing, it has a lot of issues. She would always battle with weight, hormonal issues and all that. I said, but the biggest challenge is that she may never be able to have a child. My, my mother said, I reject this in the name of Jesus. I reject this in the name of Jesus. My daughter will have a child. My daughter, they said, let's go, let's go, let's go. So they gave me some drugs, told me to come back every month. We're doing tests. It was crazy. I went from doctor to doctor. I had the same thing. They would give me drugs. They couldn't explain the bleeding consistent bleeding they thought there was no fibroid no nothing but they couldn't explain it um so i went from doctor to doctor state to state you know had the same thing whether it was in ife or lagos or worry or i went for tacot i saw many doctors because my mom was having none of it how are you not having children who is even doing that rubbish with you you are having children whether you like it or not <laughs> Uh, but I didn't think much of it because I was a virgin at the time. And honestly, I wasn't even interested. I wasn't interested in seeing the period. Did the period disappear? Let it disappear. Did they, you know, I wasn't really interested. So I eventually finished school. My final year, met a, a guy. He was a medical student. Um, and he was, he was absolutely besotted with me he was absolutely in love with me and he was a great guy he was born again went to the same fellowship so everything was good so we started a relationship however i finished school before him i left he was still in school but i planned my life it was easy enough for me if you marry a medical student and you have issues with childbirth he will know what to do it was i mean i plan i'm a planner i plan everything if i have a, if i have something to do i can take 10 months to plan it, plan it before I do so. I had literally planned my life. So I said to myself, if I marry this doctor and he was going to, he was, he, we had the plan to live in the United Kingdom. So there would be better health care. Um, if we we're going to do um, IVF, I knew I'd have a better chance outside the country. So I literally planned everything. Left school, we continued our relationship. We dated for five years. And we eventually did our introduction. Did our introduction. My parents met parents. He was Yoruba. I was Igbo. My parents overcame that. My parents at first were like, no, 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 no. We don't want to touch up our matter, you know. Um, but eventually, they met him and loved him. So they looked beyond the tribe. And we were okay. I didn't want to marry Igbo. I didn't, I, it, was a, it was a prayer point that, Lord, I will never marry an Igbo man. I don't want to marry Ibo. I don't want to marry pastor. I don't want to marry a man who's fair in complexion. I don't want. Whatever you do, Lord, I do not want. I don't want. He must not be hairy. I prayed all the prayers I prayed. So this guy was the absolute opposite of everything. And he was very romantic. Very, you know, buy you flowers for no reason. Pull out chairs. He would do mixtapes, write poems. He was just everything perfect, you know. And then he understood that I had to be serious. And so we were good. Eventually, I finished, um, so I left school, did my NYC, finished my NYC, came back, and then did um, 
started my master's in Unilag. By the time I started my master's in Unilag, he also um, got his admission to go and do his master's in the United Kingdom. So he left for the UK. Um, in that one year, we still, we would always, we had always done a long distance relationship, but we continued. But one day, my mama, this is the turning point of my life. One day, I was going to school. We had um, tutorials because exams were coming up, final exams were coming up. And so we had, me and a couple of my friends had planned we were going to do tutorials. Woke up that morning, went into the bathroom to take a bath. And I felt this unusual presence of God. And I heard within me, I want to use you. So I want to speak to you. I was like, okay, God wants to have a conversation with me. I dropped my bucket, go back into my room, get on my knees and I'm worshiping. I'm worshiping God, and as I'm worshiping, um, the, 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 the cassette player in my room starts playing. And as it's playing, Donnie McClurkin's um, Yes, I Will Trust the Lord comes on. And before that song starts, he says, what if I tell you to let go of the very thing you hold so dear? And Donnie says, yes, I will trust you, Lord. Me too, I was following him to sing. I said, yes, I will trust you, Lord. I was really, you know why I watch Shiva Mada? You know, Jesus is the only thing that matters. Anything he says, give you, give him. So I was really like, anything, Lord. What can you tell me to give you that I will not trust you? I trust you. I let go of everything. I will. So I finished. I was still on my knees. And then I felt it impressed in my heart to go and read about the woman at the well with Jesus. So I was reading it. And the woman said to Jesus, Jesus said to her, give me water. And she said, do you know who you are talking to? And Miss Samaritan, Samaritans don't get to do and Jews don't relate. And he said, Yes, but if you knew who was talking to you, if you knew the gift of God that was talking to you, you would ask him to give you water and you will never thirst again. And the woman said, Oh, give me this water and I will never thirst again. And to be honest, in my heart, I felt like, Yes, because I always have this deep thirst for you. Like, I always feel like there's more in you. I want, you know, I keep pressing. And he says that he will, he, will, he will give you this water and never thirst again. And then the woman says, oh, give me this water. And then he says something. He says, go and call your husband. And the woman says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you have rightly said, for the man that you are with is not your husband. Yeah? Mama, it was as if somebody used highlighter pen and marked that line that the man you are with is not your husband. <laughs> and this, this thing I'm doing now is what I did that day. I burst out laughing. I say, Holy Spirit, please, rough play. Which husband is not which husband? Please, Holy Spirit, stop it. Please, let's stop it. I'm not, stop it. <laughs> As in, I, after I've done the introduction, please stop it. I was that just the one I'm is not my husband. I say, it's not possible. But I knew how God speaks to me. I knew. I, this is not even very clearly. So I got up from there, shaken. I was shaken beyond measure, Mama. Shaken. And the Holy Spirit explained to me, he said, the only way I can give you the water that you need is that I'm sure that the man that you'll be submitted to will not be a lead over you. So we mm. went back and forth, me and God. I said, God, this guy is born again. He loves you. He loves me. What again are you looking for? Doctor, sir, doctor in the UK, sir, sir, doctor. Because they didn't really swear for me, ma. I, I really like enjoyment. I just look like I don't, but I like enjoyment. <laughs> I said, ah, after, and, and I was with him throughout medical school. I was with him when he was doing housemanship. As he was doing housemanship, I'm collecting salary, I would send something to him. Ah, uh ah, -uh. I, I was supportive. Even when he wanted to get his admi admission, I know the prayer I prayed. Ah, you can't, no. I'm not labor this labor and another, no, another will not take. I said, put this picture. <laughs> I said, on the day of celebration, me, I'll not be missing. They, okay, I, I said, but let's never start this. And it's not like I'm even, uh, no, 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 no. I'm not 20. Oh. Then you say I should come and start again. Because if you say it's not the man I'm with, it's not my own. Then, uh, no, I can't even start. I can't do this. So I that's what I, one thing I know is that if God asks you to give him something, what he has for you is always better. Mm. I said, okay, God, this boy did not do anything to me. And I'm not a mean person, so I'm not going to break his heart. But you, Lord, if you feel that this is what you want, then let him end it. So the next morning, we're having a conversation. Because we talk every day, morning after the night. That was the only way to keep long distance relationships. You have to be talking. So we're talking, and then he says to me, um, he said, I don't know. I'm just, I just don't know. I'm feeling like I'm not feeling you. Something wrong. 
I said, no, there's nothing wrong. <sighs> We're talking again. He says, I don't know. I just feel like, I, I don't know. I know. I just don't feel like, he said, you know what? Let's end this. Mama. <laughs> but nobody can convince me that God is not real. Mm. I countered him in too many ways. I can give you too many examples. Even if someone, that's why I don't have arguments like, uh, did God really say something or tight or what's the meaning of this? Women and uh, there are deeper things that women wear trousers, that women cover there. There are deeper things. If you truly encounter God, you can't be concerned about the small things. Uh. This guy broke up with me, Mama, the next morning. And he says to me, the next um, it was the night we were talking. And then he said to me, So I said to him, um, You said, Let's end say yes. So I get off the phone. Early the next morning, my phone is blowing up. I cried all night. Because just because you choose to obey God doesn't mean it won't be painful or it won't mm. be hard. It will be. Mm. So he, he picks my phone is blowing up. I pick up my phone and I call him. He's on the phone. He's crying. I don't know what came over me yesterday. How can I end my relationship with you? I love you, Mildred. I love you. You are my life. This, that. Ah, he says, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. I said, no, it's okay. We can't go back together. He's like, what do you mean? I said, no. Because I knew this was God. Tell Say you said I should do it. I've done it. So let me see whether you won't do your part. So I told him, like, I love you. I absolutely adore you, but I can't. We can't get back together. Huh. He will call me. He will sing. He will beg. He will pray. He will... There was nothing. But I knew. I'll be crying. No. Mama, I'll be crying. But I'll be telling him. And I'll be telling him I love you. But no. See, so what's going on? What is it? I say, I love you, but no. I knew what was going on and I couldn't go back. And so, when I had the conversation with God, I said, Holy Spirit, please, let me, you know, let me, let me even, because what's, what's the reason you are saying we should end this? Guy's a great guy. He knows me. We know it. Like, what, okay, why are you saying we should end this? I said, the thing I want to use you for, he will not be able to. I said, uh uh, this guy that's born again. In laws, what what again? I say, even what again do you want to use me for? What do you want to use me for? That a fellow Christian like me that I know how much he loves you will not allow. No, he said, Okay, ask him. So one of those days he calls me and he's begging. And so I said to him, Let me ask you a question. He said, Anything, anything. I said, If I were a pastor, would you marry me? He said, No. Mama, the phone fell from my hand. I said, Wait, let me explain to you you now that you love me like this and you are begging me if i were a pastor you might he said i didn't stutter if he said why do you want to be a pastor i said no i'm just asking i didn't know what to tell him anymore i just knew that there was no way i knew there was absolutely no way i went back to god and i said god the same way you showed me who it is not is the same way you will show me who it is so I, at that point, we, we had a reunion, a 10-year reunion from my secondary school. So I met Pastor K. He was, he was the planner. He was on that plan date. So I was in my father's house. Like I said, I'm very introverted. People don't know. Very, very. very I don't go anywhere. I'm always in my house. I don't, I'm always the last person to want to get involved in anything that we, you know, people are doing. And so they were doing the reunion and they were like, oh, they're doing meetings. I, I, I won't go. Um, they are calling people to something, something, and won't answer them. They will send people to my house. I'll say, oh, okay, I've heard. Oh, great idea. Fantastic reunion. Wow. I won't go. <laughs> I'll just stay back in my house. So I think that one of those days, they had a meeting on my streets because some of them were planning. And then Pastor K says, oh, um, I hear that Mildred is on the street, but she never comes. They say, ah, Mildred doesn't come. There's one of that girls who doesn't come. So they first went to the girl's house, Kemi. Then Kemi brought them to my house. And she came up upstairs to tell me that please i know you're going to kill me but when they came to my house i said it's not only me that was so far this is i brought them to your house there there are guys downstairs i said ah i know them i just losing braids mama i just losing braids so my hair was really i was just looking hard as in i just was really losing it there and there so i'm not even comb the braid the cocoa out <laughs> so and then there was no light so i was wearing jalabia my dad's jalabia i came downstairs hmm. thank you there was no light so nobody could see me so I came down and said, like, ah, you know, what are you doing here? And he was like, I didn't come on me. So I said, I know for next time now. So I was just talking, just in one of the guys there was my friend in secondary school. So I was just in with that one. So he now said, I don't have your number. It's been a while. So I now said, oh, okay, this is my 
my number, called up my number. So Pasquier was standing with the guy and says, Ah, me too, I'm collecting the number. I said, Collect, now you consign me. You know, I just laughed with them and then they left. I went to her cup and I totally forgot about it. I didn't think much of it. A few days later, they were disturbing me. Come, come, come for the reunion. Come for me. I eventually went for the reunion. Got to the reunion. I was sitting down and then one guy, I don't even remember him, walks up to me and says, Oh, Mildred, you do want to dance. So I said something, even though I knew it was rude. I said, Where is your gun? He said, What? I say, Mildred should dance to secular music. So I turned my face. So the guy just started shouting, This is how you've always been. Who do you think you are? Do you think you're, you're a snob? You're this. He was just shouting. No, I was just looking at him like that. Ah, I don't even know who you are. So which one is this? Is that I've always been? I don't remember you from school. I don't remember anything. He was very angry. He was shouting, Who do you think you are? While he was shouting, Pastor K came there. I said, What's going on? And so, Mama, this is the part that I probably need to bring up. Because sometimes people think that when you're called to ministry or you're a Christian, that you're automatically perfect overnight. You will still have weaknesses. You will still have things that you have to work on. So there's an anointing that makes preaching easy. But just like every other preacher, you still need the anointing that makes living and obeying the word easy. Mm. So of course, before this time, one of the major things I'd always battled with was anger. And this is partly because now, of course, as a counselor and as a coach, you know, I understand that it was because of trauma growing up from the point where I felt, first of all, my sister has replaced me, so nobody's going to look out for me again, to the point where I get to secondary school and I feel abandoned. Why did they throw me here? You know, why are they, why are they, and nobody's listening. If you talk, they punish you, so I start keeping quiet. And as I started keeping quiet, I started imploding. And I started imploding, I now developed anger issues. So I became very hot-tempered. So as that guy was doing that thing, my body was already shaking. That if I stand here, this guy will not survive it. First of all, that bottle is old now, break and break his head. I was already, all my body was shaking. But thank God for Jesus. Because I was about to stand up, was when Pastor K came. And he said, he said, what's going on here? So the guy was like, I don't even know who she thinks she, she is. So I, I just, I, I was sitting there, I just, so Pastor said, so what's going on? I said, I said, I don't know who he's talking to, but I can guarantee that he will not be able to talk again in a few minutes. So I was like, ah. So he turned and told the guy, leave this place now. Now, Pastor K was a bad boy in school. He was so bad that he even used to bully our mates. So if he tells you to get out of a place, you better get out of a place. And a lot of them didn't know. Even I didn't know he was a pastor at the time. I just knew he was King you know. So I didn't know he was pastoring. So he told the guy to get out and the guy left. So he sat down with me and I said, ah, why is your body shaking like this? I said, ah, God, this boy, this boy, God saved this boy just now. He said, ah, what were you going to do? I said, you don't want to know what I'm going to do. Um, when my mama, when my grandmother died, I went to the village for the burial. And I've shared this, a couple of people know this story. <laughs> But I want to explain how bad my anger used to be and how God can take you from, if you will allow the word to work, God can take you from whatever you think is a weakness to who you are, who, you, who he can make you, who he wants you to be. So my grandmother died. Um, in my village, there's no light. I don't know, well, there's light now, but that time there was no light. So everybody that would walk, do anything, would do it with generator. So... There was only, I found one cold, cold malt and I went to hide it inside the freezer. Under, under, under. You know when they do ceremonies like that, things will be missing. So I carried that only one malt, mama, and I went to hide it. So I hid that malt then. I was born again. This is I'm telling you, mama. Born again, talk, talking, love the Lord. This was, this was the university. Love, love the Lord. Probably even already doing ministry, uh, demons in the dust, reaching out to people who had been sexually molested and all that, all the things God had asked me to do in second. I was doing this thing. I went and hid this mouth. After the ceremony, I said to myself, Soul, go and look for your mouth and relax. Like that man, <laughs> that man, I said, Go and look for your mouth and relax. I went inside, put my hand, Mama, I did not see my mouth. I checked the game, brought out everything from the freezer. I did not see my mouth. So I went outside. I saw my brothers and their friends sitting down. And there was only one month in that village, Mama, that was cold. Only one month. So I went there. I said, please, people should not be angry. I beg. Who see my moths? They say moths. 
you keep words. I say, who's my? So I saw one of my brother's friends. He was holding words. I say, bros, no verse, no. No be my mouth with us. He say, we, you talk to me, get out of here. Very rude thing. I say, I'd not say anything to you. I say, bros, I beg. No be my mouth with us. He turned the mouth. Mama, he looked at it. He said, this mouth. He turned it and emptied the content on the floor. The only cold mouth in the village. Turned the mouth and emptied the content on the floor. Mama, I don't know, but I believe that anger is a spirit. And if you are not careful, anger can destroy you. In fact, that's what God told me. He told me, he said, anger rests in the bosom of fools. And that is what I think of you if you cannot control your emotions. Because your emotions are not meant to control you. Mama, I lifted this guy. I don't know where that spirit came from. I, this guy is like PK. I lifted him up and I slammed him on the car. Then I held on to his neck. You know that Adam's apple? I was pressing it. I, I don't know. I was just saying, kill him, kill him. Because of moth, mama. This I'm telling you, nobody would have known who Mildred was. Nobody, there would be no Pastor M. Because um, if you cannot control yourself, Satan will destroy your destiny. I let this guy, mama, slam the Monica. And I was pressing his neck. My brother was saying, you will kill him all. Do you know what I answered? I said, eh, he go die. My brother was trying to remove my hand. Mama, they couldn't remove my hand. One of my brothers pulled his belt and was belting me. I did not even feel the pain. That's to show you how much, that's, that's to show you how, you know when they say blind with rage or blind with fury, people think it's just a, it's an expression. It is, it is truth. I've, I fought my tailor. I gave tailor clothes. Mama, mama, I gave tailor clothes in the market, the show market, to sew for me. I went to school, came back after one semester. He didn't even, he didn't even put scissors in the cloth, tuckers of sewing it. He told me I sewed. He kept me there for two hours, thinking that when he comes back to the shop, I would have gone. He came back to his shop with the material. I first slapped him, padlocked his shop. My younger sister was with me that day. Padlocked his shop in the market, the show market. As I was going, I fell inside gutter because I, I couldn't see the gutter in front of me because I was going to... <laughs> and then at some point God told me if if Satan can just do you like this and it's something get you angry and something he would destroy you go and read about Moses Moses was so gifted he was so great but anger did not allow him to enter the promised land anger that's to show you how angry is so you can imagine what would have happened that night mama and that was the night that God had planned that I would meet Pastor K. Really, really meet the man that's supposed to marry me. So imagine if I had broken that person's head. That's how my husband would turn. <laughs> I'd be going and I wouldn't know. And so he came and said, so calm down now. What do you need? I said, nothing. Hmm. I said, I just need to go. If I let me be going, I need to go. I need to go. I was like, I just calm down. I was, but of course, nothing at the time. And I didn't really think of him like that. Because even at that, even at the time, the first time I met Pastor K, funny enough, I was still engaged. Mm. So my and so of course i didn't even see him in that light i didn't think of him i was i was i was wearing an engagement ring when i met Pascal the first time so much later after there was one period so after i'd ended this relationship the guy was still begging and all that so i went I, I couldn't go to my church i used to attend this present house and so i couldn't attend i attend my church that day so i just said ah, which church is near my house today okay ah, i even hear that kingsley has a church today pastor let me go and see and i said to myself maybe mm, he's going to be pastor because when he was in school, he was a bad boy. Whether he's using this one to scam people, let me go. You know, so I just went. And I got there and I was very blunt. I was like, ah, full church. Oh. And he's preaching. He's a really serious, you know, serious man of God that has church and everything. I was like, ah. Interestingly, at the time, I thought he was married. So I go, I, I, so I, 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 I wanted to leave that day. So he was not like, no, that he's not married. He's not, we just laughed and just said, he was like, I, he saw me when he was preaching. He saw me when I even entered the church. That I came late. So then he would go and drop me. What I should do, I should wait for him that he will take me home after. But I asked pastor's meetings. Me, I've never dated pastor. I don't know that pastor is still... I, I didn't, all those things. I was not a pastor's wife, pastor's girlfriend. Some people had those things in school. They were pastor's girlfriend. I don't know anything like that. I was innocently minding my business. So he said, you take me home. I said, oh, okay, no problem. He said, I should just wait for him. So I was waiting for him. Mama, I felt that very unusual presence of God. Me, I was even thinking in my head, ah, this church, they're very anointed with I see the presence of God is so strong here. And God said to me, I want to speak to you. Ah, I said, okay. So I brought down my Bible. I was waiting for him. 
I was reading my Bible. Then I read about where Samuel, that's what God impressed my heart to read about that story, where Samuel went to anoint David. He got to David's house. And they first brought the first one out. And Samuel said, ah, surely this is the anointed of the Lord. And God said, no, I don't see the way you see. So I don't look on the outward, I look at the heart. When God said that thing to me, and I want to use this to, to talk to single ladies, it's important for you to not miss what God is doing because of what you think you know. So remember, I had laid down all the things that I cannot, I cannot take. I cannot marry pastor. I cannot marry Igbo man. I cannot marry a man that is hairy. I cannot marry a man that is Igbo or com uh, fair, fair in complexion. Because all of those things had been there, I had blocked my mind to the possibility that it can ever be him. Because I can't be, me, I'm not pastor's wife. Someone will annoy me, I'll break the person's head. Me. I cannot be pastor's wife now. It's not possible. <laughs> and at some point, the thing that I've been struggling with, including God's head telling me, you now need to learn to speak out. I say, eh? No, I can't be talking. I mean, I can't be talking. I don't, I don't, I don't want anybody to insult me. I don't want anybody to say I said something I didn't say. And God said to me, you must set your face like a flint for the assignment that I have for you. I say, which one is set your face like a flint? I now have to go and study what a flint is. It's a hard rock. Say like that, like she said that, don't be moved by what people do. Then he gave me another scripture. He said, I have called you to live for an audience of one. He said, you're like Abraham. I called him alone and I blessed him. They don't look around you, look to me. I am your source, I am your sustainers, and I am your master. He says, so when I tell you to say something, do not be afraid of the people. Hey. I said, this kind of strong, strong assignment that you say you want to use me for. That I said, when, when God is telling you down that this is what you should be learning. And so he says, and I've given you a voice, but it is not your voice. When I speak is when you speak. You don't speak when I'm not speaking. He said, look at Jesus. He only said what he heard his father say. He only did what he saw his father do. You are no different. So these were things that, you know, God had to teach me as I was growing growing in things of God. So that day when God said to me, um, you know, I don't look on the outside, I look at the heart. So what he was saying to me was all those things, all those qualities, you better push them aside. And so he, when they anointed to anoint David, they said there's one more. He's the youngest and he's taking care of the sheep. And when he came, Samuel said, God said to Samuel, arise, anoint him for his one. That same thing that happened, Mama. That same mark, highlighter marker that he's the youngest and is taking care of the sheep. Arise and anoint him for his one. I say, I don't understand. The Holy Spirit said, what position is Kingston is from me? I say, he's the youngest. He said, what do pastors do? I say, they take care of the sheep. He said, arise and anoint him for his one. <laughs> Mama, I started laughing. I say, kiss me, go, go. Me. I'll buy for somewhere from my secondary school. Go for me, but I say, kiss me, go. God, please. What kind of thing is this now? Holy Spirit, please, 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 please. Let's never... I say, see himself, teeny bow boy with round head, yellow, hairy. Ah, everything I said no to. Ah, please, 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 Holy Spirit, please, let's not do this. Let's not. <laughs> when we even start. In fact, I said, what would I even tell my parents? That I left doctor to my pastor. Please, mama, oh. I remember my parents are Catholic. So I told my mother that I met someone who's a pastor. She said, and what does he do? I say, he's a pastor. She said, and what's his work? <laughs> I said, mommy. Pastoring is a job. She said, eh. So how will you eat? Said, it, was, <laughs> it was so funny. I, no, 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 baby. No, I'm not calling you. No. Sorry, ma'am. My son is calling him. So I now so I I I, I couldn't say anything. I said, God, okay. I, I will do what you say, but it's up to you. Me, I'm not even gonna do like you have said anything to me. I'm not going to. So along the line, of course, Kings and I became friends and all of that. And then along the line, he now proposed to me. And before we knew it, before long, we are married. Hmm. <laughs> we now got married. And a lot of rude shocks, Mama. Oh. In, uh, and I think that God did it because Pastor Kia and I met and married in nine months. Nine months. Remember, I did some work for five years. Oh. Nine months. We did our counseling, but to be honest, most of the counseling was on my head. You know, when you're marrying a pastor, 
this is what you should do. You know when you're marrying a pastor, this is how you should be. You know when you're marrying a pastor, the Bible says that the anointing makes him attractive, so you will not be insecure. You will not come and chasing women from the church. You know when you're marrying a pastor, and honestly, the, the pastor that did our counseling had good intentions. However, I feel like, and this is where most, I think most pastors' wives struggle. The fact that you get married and nobody tells you what to expect or what you should do. Nobody. I got in there and all I was told was, make sure you don't cause trouble. Make sure you pray for him all the time. Make sure you submit to him. Make sure you do this. Make sure you do that. Make sure, make sure, make sure. <laughs> At some point, it's me, I say I see my ass. So the one he's supposed to do, Mko, because I really, that's all I really want to know. What's he supposed to do? Because all I heard was, I should make sure I do this. I should make sure I do that. I should make sure I do this. And, and I thank God that that somehow is the ministry that we are in now. Because I feel like that balance is essential for a marriage to really work. Marriage is too heavy for one person to carry. Okay. I say it all. It, it is too heavy for one person. And somehow, they will roll. I don't know. I've forgotten what they call that thing. They will roll. You know what, Mama? You know what people want to carry calabash? They will now roll that cloth. I put on your head to give you. They will roll it for women on the wedding day. But they don't say anything to men. No. They don't say the man, eh, you are, you are now a man, you have found favor. Eh, he has found me, has found favor. Me in God that I found you, what did I find? They now roll work for me. A wise woman builds her home. <laughs> so me, I should roll uh, that thing that I used to carry the marriage. But the man, he should balance that he has found favor. And so I really thank God that we're doing that ministry now because I feel like the balance is essential. It's very necessary. Oshuka, that's what it is, Abby. <laughs> that's yes, man. The balance is important. It takes two people to make a marriage work. It takes two people to successfully parent children. It is not a woman's responsibility. It is not a man's responsibility. It is both of you. And interestingly, the person that is even supposed to take the lead on these things is the one person that they don't really talk to. And so when I go and I found out that I wasn't really equipped. Nobody told me what to do. Nobody told me how to live with a man because men are different from women. Very different. And again, opposites attract. So my husband and I are complete opposites. Complete. I am such a perfectionist. My husband is, he's okay now. Nah. It's not that deep. Ah, I say it's deep, oh. So it's deep. If this thing is not straight like this, you can give me hypertension. I cannot. And I find that because both of us made up our minds from the beginning, we had certain agreements, you know, that in this marriage, we, it must work. That was the first thing we said to ourselves. This marriage must work. And we must enjoy, both enjoy ourselves in this marriage. So that at, at all days, one person will say, after all I did for you, not do anything for me. We are doing for each other. If anything is paining you, tell me. If you don't like something, you tell me. Both of us must enjoy this marriage. So if we've decided that this marriage will work, and both of us must enjoy this marriage, then we consistently need to have conversations about what we want and what we do not want. And at every season, we must recognize that we may outgrow each other. So we need to stay on the same page. So when my husband um, would go for, when, so when we first got married, I, would re I realized that when we'd go for maybe meetings like pastor's training, I was the only wife in the room. All of my friends would come alone. They would come. And it was unusual. I would feel very uncomfortable. Well, God would remind me, remember, I called you alone. Set your face like a flint. Learn everything they're learning. Don't, don't say, hey, wives are not here. So my husband says, we're going to this place. My natural tendency is that ah, you take me there, I'll be the only woman there again now. We'll now be somehow. We'll now even you, you look somehow as if you cannot leave your wife. they are like, what's that? We are going. Because everything I'm learning, you're going to learn it. I'm going to train you in a way that even if I'm not around you, you will be a better version of me. And I can be sure that you can take care of yourself. You can take care of the church and you can take care of the children. So everything, I want to make sure that I learned everything. Everything he knows, no matter what conference he's doing. If he's traveling abroad for a conference, something training, we pay for two of us. You must follow me. And so I noticed that I would be, it was very unusual. I would be the only person. I would, it didn't matter. And then he started giving me responsibilities that other people felt, uh-uh, like, wow, you are giving the a woman. My husband didn't think that he didn't, he never, well, he never really had experience with women too because 
he didn't have sisters they're all boys and his mom is a military woman so you can't really call her a woman like that so all of them are all boys so he a lot of things i also had to teach him so when we got married and this is this is for newlyweds especially when you get married one of the things that people think is that because you love each other marriage is going to work marriage doesn't work like that marriage doesn't work like that there's so much work to be done marriage is a shift for me and shift for you marriage is like two of you are lying down on your bed if somebody spreads their body too much and you're uncomfortable you better tap him that split a shift from this morning i'm about to fall and if that person shift you balance the you to you are comfortable what we are taught especially in africa is that your husband should balance and that you should be hanging off the bed and don't say a word no the reason why most men are like that is because nobody tells them that ah do you know that your body spread too much there's no space for me on the bed and unfortunately men don't notice things if you don't bring it to their attention so a man will balance not because he's wicked but because you've also trained him that is okay because that's how i saw my father balance that's how i saw my grandfather that's how i saw men balance so we women are supposed to manage no i don't believe that i don't believe that a woman is inferior to a man however i also believe that everybody has their place especially in marriage so I know that a lot of uh, there's been a lot of oh, drama about so say, hey, Miss Anti feminist, anti feminist, and she, they have they've dragged me. But you see, Mama, like you always say, it's a personal race, a very personal one. You see, this social media, all of us have it. You cannot drag me, and I'll not leave the social media for you. you drag me when I come out, drag you, dragging to dragging. It's our social media. It's not your own. It doesn't belong to you, because you don't agree with what I said. You now say me I should be social media for you. It doesn't work like that. Because me too, I don't agree with what you said. The last one that asked me on, they said, uh, I, "Mama, I'll get back to what I was saying about uh, um, what you need to, um, what you need to do when you first get married." But the last one that, the last one that they dragged me on was that I said that a woman, kind of almost similar to what you said a couple of years ago, that you dragged you, where you said that if your husband needs money, I can't give you a colossal failure. <laughs> this one, me, I said that if you are going, if a girl, if you uh, ask a girl out on a date and she asks you for transport money, that she she is useless. Or something i can't remember and the reason why i said that you know and of course usually i would not respond to any of these things but i i i really feel like <laughs> i really feel like mama i should probably even deal with this here so someone had asked a question at that meeting and of course people always take 10 minutes maybe a 10 minutes or five minutes clip and try to make it something that it isn't and what they don't understand is that it all things work together for our good so even people who have never heard of us before you do all those kind of things they will not say who is this person and they will come to your page and follow you secretly better so somebody had asked a question at that meeting that somebody said that when a man wants to take you out on a date make sure as a woman you collect transport money uh, the man must pay for your uber the man must pay for your clothes he must pay for your hair so i say ah, i don't know that now people have become it's now prostitute low-key prostitution because because how is somebody taking you out on a date? Both of you are supposed to enjoy yourselves, get to know each other. That's what it is, right? Why are they paying you as if you are a prostitute? So I said, if you are inviting somebody on a date and she cannot even pay her transfer money, she's useless. If somebody is not useful, are they not useless? Abby? Because the way they are, they came and they were saying, oh, she, she, they, so they're not, they're not say, but you see, those things don't even move me because I've set my face like a flint. And my point really is this. The things that God told me back then, because I started practicing them, now I see they are used. At that time, I didn't. I didn't understand why I should be okay with saying what God says I should say and not be worried what other people think. I don't know why. I, I never understood why it shouldn't matter what people think about you. You live for an audience of one. I, I, I overheard someone did a video, Mama, and, that, and I'm worried. The reason why I am so vocal about women and what we do and that's why i thank god for one man conference that's coming up and of course mama is hosting the grand finale she's gonna read it. i'm so excited mama. um so the reason why i do that is because i need to show women that you can aspire, aspire to greatness you are not invalid you are not crippled because you're a woman you're not useless there's so much in you even if you are weaker vessel you are not weaker content the mm. thing that a man is what he put in you so you have every and you have access to the father just like they do we don't have to go to our husbands to get god to answer our prayers god answers our prayers so i don't understand why a woman will say oh be fine i, I heard a video recently my sister sent it to me i thought i said it's a joke it can't be possible the guest said before you take me out on a date 
you must first go and book a restaurant and the restaurant must be in a hotel then you book a night for me there then you will pay for my dress i will not go out with anybody that does not pay for my dress then you will pay for my hair my my hair then you will get the makeup artist because it is because of you i'm making up then you will pay my transports and when i get there listen to me i know what i will do so don't ever ask me after everything for sex i know what am i a child i know what i'm like this is this are, these are the people who are vocal on social media so when god is saying be vocal now i understand it because i really really would mind my business i don't my natural personality is to mind my business my i will be facing my own work and my children i don't care what's happening i said but god says be vocal because if i keep saying it if gold rusts what will i undo if christians are messing up why do why are we complaining about believers if christians christians think it's okay for a man to want to take you out on a date and they they should pay your transports so you 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 as a you are a full-grown human being what exactly are you doing what's your existence for these are the things that i'm fighting because these are the people mama who are going to raise the next generation these are the mothers and my children unfortunately in that generation no? so if i'm not shouting that they should train their children will my children marry themselves so i'm shouting now that there's a proper way to live there's a proper way to do things and the only way is to go back to the world so every time i shout these things we say why does she does she think she is because she and her husband are always feeling like they know everything they're always telling people what to do and what not to do in their marriage i'm really not telling you what to do or what not to do in your marriage i'm telling you what the bible says it's up to you to choose whether you want to do it or not do it and contrary to what people think my calling really is not relationship a lot of people think it is I'm, I'm i teach relationship because i am my husband's helper i understand my assignment that i'm called to help him if my husband decides to teach faith tomorrow you will see me right beside him if it but my core mama my core is fruits of the spirit character behavior people don't have it again how do you say you are a christian you don't have behavior you pray don't 10 hours i'm sorry cannot come out of your mouth I'm, I'm sorry to say i'm sorry you can't say it thank you you can't say it. when i first got married to my husband one of the things i realized was that even though we loved each other we were different my husband was the kind of person i would just get up in the morning and move without saying good morning he wouldn't say i'm, I'm sorry he wouldn't he just he was just say eh, okay you know but instead of telling you thank you for something say eh, but you know i'm happy about it no 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 you will tell me thank you you will tell me i'm sorry that's it's not it's not it's not going to diminish you you don't become less of a man because you apologize to a human another human being like you and so initially when we got married he wasn't that kind of person but god told me you will number one don't disrespect him but pattern for him what you want him to be and so even today when single people come to me what's the most important thing i should know when i have to get married this most important thing you should know eh? first of all drop a list right on that the top of that list my future husband write what you want he must be kind he must be this he must write everything then after you have written your list make it a long list though. then go and erase that thing you wrote on the top my future husband write your own name then ask yourself if you are all those things because if all those if you are not all those things then you have no right to be looking for someone who is all those things but these are the truths we put on social media somebody come and fight who do you think you are why do you want to why do you who said you should which end i don't answer to you that's why it doesn't bother me who, who puts me up on i don't listen to the blogs i don't follow them they follow me because that's the only reason why they know what i said and what i didn't say i don't follow you and i'm not concerned and this is not pride it's understanding my identity who i am sent by and what i'm sent to do so i see all these things so i had to pattern for him now my husband will wake up in the morning he will, he will kiss me he will hold me he will ask me did you sleep well what do you plan to do today uh -uh. in my mind i'm like eh? this is somebody that initially not to talk of the fact that when we now got when we first got married because he's a sanguine my husband believes we should enjoy this life ah mama you haven't met a groove major until you met my husband he likes life and he believes jesus came in fact his favorite scripture is john 10 10 that jesus came that we may have life and that we may enjoy this life <laughs> till it is overflowing that's my husband he believes in groove you don't know when so when we first got married he will, he will make he used to make a lot of money then he will make money mama i was still let's save money my husband will tell me ah if you save this money jesus come go 
Enjoy your life. That's okay. We say for the children. They say they will make their own. <laughs> hey. Wow, I'm telling you. I know uh, my children will not be poor. They will make their own. See, what you leave for your children is a legacy God. I say, my brother. Just because you want to spend this money. He said, no worry. You haven't said that this money will finish. You have more. So I was rudely shocked. Rudely shocked. That uh, somebody can be like this. Everything he ends, he eats it. I've never seen this in my life. Because I believe that you don't spend everything you have. I've never, I've never been able to do it. That you must, there must be a part of you that saves. I was like, no, I, I, let's enjoy life. Let's groove. You see some of my mother, ah, we're balling with our budget. What do you want to buy? Buy it. So, when we first got married, mama, he would go out and come back. He went out one day and came out, came back with a South African barbell that cost 250,000 naira. Dog, mama, dog. Dog that is not asset. It does not help our destiny in any way. Nothing. Dog that is just doing woof woof. And the dog even came and now broke our gates because dog was massive. So he pushed our gates metal gate and gate fell down so my husband came back and said ah that this house is too small for the dog let's move house that was his solution mama <laughs> that was the solution that the dog is too big it's too big for the house. let's move house so i i i was rudely shocked and at some point a little bit frustrated that who, who does this who spends everything you're making so much money and you can't see it and from the beginning we agreed that we're going to we're going to use all God's principles. So we believe that you are one when you're married. So we're going to we're going to have one account. So we had a joint account. So I'm seeing money going in, in and coming out. I'm seeing money going in. I'm seeing coming out. And it was either to sign. Hey, I say God, this is not really what I had in mind. We are no. I'm not doing this with you, Lord Jesus. You you have to sort this out. If not, I'm getting another account, and that means your word doesn't work. But we all know that the word works. So I went to pray about it. And as I was praying, God said something to me. He said, remember what I said, that whatever you want someone to do for you, he said, take the initiative and do it for them. He says, there, there, you're reading your Bible every day. It's right there. I said, okay. So I said, so what do I do now? He said, number one, don't disrespect him. Every time God has asked me to deal with anything in my husband's life, he has always said to me, don't disrespect him. And you know, for for me, he was my classmate, so it can be easy to do that. So I have been intentional in making sure that I don't disrespect him. And so anytime I feel like the disrespect is coming on, I will add sir. So my husband is calling me, I say sir. He will turn. He will say something, I say sir. Because I know that I'm getting angry. That can you spend money like this? What's wrong with you? And God said, don't disrespect him. What do you want him to do? You want him to save. Pattern it for him. Show him. So my husband would call, uh, come and say, ah, honey, I need to ah, tie. Oh, I was supposed to pay for something, no, but I, ah, the money's not complete. I'll say, how much do you need? He said, oh, it's not much. Maybe like 200 k. I said, okay, I have, I'll give him. He said, you have 200 k. How do you have 200 k? When do you have 200 k? I finished all the money I can. I said, eh, the money that you gave me to do something, or the money I, the, so sometimes when we want to go shopping, for instance, my husband will say, okay, you take this amount, I'll take this amount. Yeah, I will not spend my, what am I buying? I don't want other things. Designer bag, hmm. Yeah, all those things. I'm not really big. I'm not materialistic at all. So I'll just go and give the money. I'll bring it out. I did this thing like three times. One day he called me. He said, come, why do you always have money? I said, because I save. He said, what do you mean you save? I said, I save. I don't spend everything I have. He said, yeah. He said, okay. Okay, no problem. He moved on. So obviously, the seeds were being sown. If I had disrespected him, God told me, if you had disrespected him, what would happen is that he would not listen to you. And even though he knows you are right, he will still choose to misbehave because he feels like you have disrespected him. And so I kept on doing that. Then one day God said to me, you know your husband wants you to be spending money, right? Because we tell me you don't even buy anything. Buy now, what's wrong with you? I said, I don't want anything. So I said, so that money that he's asking you to take, why don't you take the money? As he's taking, take and, and save it for him. I said, eh, eh. Ah, so my husband, if I see my husband, I take 100k, means I'll take 100k. I'll go and save it. I opened the account for him in his name. I'll go and save it. He'll take 100k, I'll take 100k. Ah. So one day, he asked the accountant for statement for something. He wanted to do something. So he looked at him, ah, why is person consistently taking money like this? Every week, she's taking a certain amount of money. She said, sir, I think you should talk to him. Talk to her. So he came and said, honey, why are you taking money? I said, the same way as you, you are taking money now. He said, wait, what are you buying? I don't buy anything. I said, ah, who 
to them by anything. He say, I know you. You are either giving somebody or do something with it. So what are you? What are you doing for? I now say, I was planning, you no, know, that when you turn fifty, I will not bring out this money. But as it is now, they have spoiled my surprise. He said, eh, what are you doing? I said, I opened account for your savings account. He said, savings. I said, I was going to invest. I was waiting for it to be a certain amount, and I will not invest it. And I was just about to invest it when he asked me. He now said, uh, -uh. how much is the money? As in, mama, with this day, like, how much can the money possibly be? When I told him the amount, my his mouth opened. He said, eh? This amount of money you've saved. He said, without me being involved. He said, let's do it well, please. Let's do it well. Oh, my, that's how we start saving. <laughs> we start saving so much that if my husband does, if you say one person, say, do you need it? Mm. I said, <laughs> I saw all of a sudden. And God told me, he said, sometimes you don't really have faith in the principles I put in the world. He said, when the clouds are full, the rain must surely give way. Most times you use that scripture for just sowing and reaping. It's about it's a life scripture. When the clouds are full, when your husband has gotten to the point where that thing has really maximized in his heart, it has crystallized, he has seen you do it over and over and over again. He will say this thing makes sense. Then you will have your result. This is not only about sowing money, it's also about sowing seeds of time, prayer, character. And so now my husband has somehow become a saver. Now he's investing every minute. Um, honey, there's this money there. I just invested it all. Don't plan with it all. I say, eh? I can't even believe this is you. Why, why am I saying this? Because so many people are fighting over things that if they listen to God, he will give them the solution to. And the solution, first of all, is never to disrespect your husband. Why? Because respect is what, what he feeds off. A lot of women don't know that. So a lot of people are fighting that. See, every time, it's, it's, when, it's, it's when it's respect, respect, respect. Eh, it's not that they give him his respect. The end result is what is important. So don't fight to always win the argument. Fight to win the agreement. My husband says that all the time. The greatest power of marriage is agreement. And a lot of people don't use it. They don't know that. All the time. They're fighting. When my husband did this, my husband you are, Satan is winning. I always tell people, men are not the enemy. That's one of my fights with this, um, this whole feminism movement that they have messed up because i understand that feminism didn't, wasn't really about this there's a there's a new one that has been messed up where it's a fight against men and that's the one i'm fighting people don't understand that that's the one that's breaking marriages that's the one that's destroying homes that's the one that's destroying our daughters and satan understands this when women want to become men then there are no more women and women are more powerful so we're we're literally letting down a greater thing for something that is less. And I don't mean this in a demeaning way. I just mean this that God said, it's not good for man to be alone, so I'll make him a help meet. And one thing I found out about God is if God's sending you someone to help you, it means the person is better than you. The person already knows that thing you know or wants to, or can do that thing you can't do. So you are leaving the, the higher level. God says something is not good. He made something better. And you are saying, oh, no, I don't want to be better. I want to just be average. I want to be good. And so that's what women are doing. And because we are doing that, and we're focusing so much on the girl child, the girl child, the girl child, what we are doing is we're leaving behind the boy child. And so the girl child grows up, finds out she's amazing, looks behind her, and sees a man who is not so amazing is proposing to her and saying, why? Why would I marry somebody who's not amazing? Let me go and marry another woman. And so Satan is winning. So we're all moving from there and helping the whole um, LGBT transgender movement, we're helping them without realizing it because they are getting married, they can't have babies, and their slogan is, We're coming for your children. So they know exactly what they're doing. Satan knows what he's doing. But we Christians are always, we are always reactive, we're never proactive. We're always, Hey, this is a let's be praying, a let's be praying. No, but we cause this problem. The girl child, the girl child, the boy child, don't call. Somebody has to train the boy child too. I believe all. All children are important. I don't know about boys' lives matter. I don't know about girls' matter. I believe children's lives matter. All children should be raised as human beings, not dependent on another, not reliant on another, but we should all be one. So over the years, God, God has helped me to grow and evolve. I've not always been the most patient person, but the word helped me. Anger, the word helped me. Children, the word helped me. My pastor K was a big leap of faith. And when, um, when I met him, I told him, when he proposed to me, I told him that 
ah, I need to say something to you. Doctor said I may not be able to have children. He said to me, who said that? Who are doctors? I said, those people that wear white and carry stead to school, they are the ones that said that I cannot have children. And he said to me that God's word is very clear that none shall be barren in the land, whether male or female. He said, we will have our children. In fact, let's name them before we get married. And so we named our children before we got married. And somehow, the journey, I can't I say it was an easy one because some people just think, oh, I, mean, I didn't run around for prayer. Um, even when I tried to, God didn't let me. Why? Because, you see, the relationship with God is key in getting everything. And that's why I keep telling people, being able to hear God will change your life. So even when I wanted to start that journey, God told me, you, it will be a fruitless one. Don't try it. Don't start running from doctor to doctor. I tried. Mama, I even tried. I went to the first doctor. I, when I got the machine that they were supposed to use to, to do my ultrasound just stopped working. I went to the second doctor. He told me to come out and do tests. A few days to go and do the test, I met his wife. I didn't even know it was his wife at the time. I met one woman there. And she was telling me that, oh, her children, her business name is Davida. I said, oh, those are my children's names. I'm believing God. I'm going to sow seed in her life. She said, oh, her children's name are David and Davida too. I said, are you serious? See, I'm going to sow seed in your life. I was walking to my car with my friend. My friend asked me, do you know that woman? I said, I don't know. I said, you don't know that woman? I said, no. He said, ah, that's your doctor's wife. I said, you serious? My doctor has David and Davida. She said, with David and Davida. Your doctor, they find Pekin. Their wife, they talk faith. Mama. I sat in my car and cried that day. I cried for hours. I go back to my office and told Pastor K. He laughed at me. He laughed and fell down from his chair. He said, be running to the doctor when the only doctor that you need is God. I sat down, Mama. I opened my husband's concordance Bible opened his Dick's Bible, opened his Thomas Nelson Kank. I sat down on the floor and I started looking for every scripture. Mama, every. It's not now that there's Google. I sat down. This was my assignment. I would sit and write out every promise concerning childbirth, concerning um, pregnancy, concerning miscarriage, concerning um, um, stillbirth. I wrote everything down. And I started, I started writing with my name. So God told me then to the same way you take medicine, God, you're looking for a doctor. The same way, take this medicine three times a day. So I will confess the word morning, afternoon, and night that there are two nations in my womb. Two people will be separated from my body. One will be physically stronger than the other. That's how I know I'm having a boy and a girl. And my children, like olive plants, surround my table. I was writing all the scriptures. This is a reward from my husband because he fears the Lord. No one is barren, everyone wears jeans. I was writing the scriptures. <laughs> As in, every morning, I would say them morning, afternoon, night. And at some point, Mama, I just knew that I was pregnant. I knew it like, like I knew my name. I didn't have any symptoms or any sign. I knew I was pregnant. This thing took me five years. I was confessing this thing morning, afternoon, and night for five years. And I shopped for my children for five years. I had three suitcases. Every time I go anywhere, I would buy something, put in their box. I would pack it. I would speak to them. I described even up to their temperament. I would speak over them. David, you, you'll be a son, you'll be blood. Everything I called it for, everything. I kept on doing this for five years. And then one day, in 2013, I still remember, the word for that year was, I would, this, in 2013, I would testify. I woke up January 5th, early in the morning, just running out to go and exercise. And God told me to lose weight the year before. I would say, how will I lose weight? Oh, me, I don't know I'm going to do it. I'm tired of different things, trying different things. And God told me, you walk by faith. So I knew that God wanted me to walk. And I started walking. Mama, from 18, I dropped to 12. And it was in that season that God now showed me his power. I woke up that morning, told me to do a pregnancy test. I did a pregnancy test. Mama, I saw two lines. I couldn't count. Oh. You know, when, we're, when God turns around your captivity, you're like, then that dream. I saw two lines on the pregnancy. Say, I went to my husband and I said, please, how many lines is this? He said, I don't understand. It's two now. Mama, I was pregnant for the first time in my life. <laughs> After eight years of marriage, the first time in my life, I saw two lines on a stick. That day, I didn't even know. I was like a mad woman on the road. I was walking on the road, crying, laughing, praying in tongues. People were turning to look at me, but I didn't care. When God has done you well, when you when God, has, you don't care who's around you. I was shouting, he on the road like a mad person. <laughs> my husband said, okay, go and do your chest. And I went to the mama for the first time in my life, there was a baby in my womb. 
I went for antenatal about a month later, and one over Zillow's nurse gave me medicine. At the end of the day, after antenatal, she gave me medicine. I said, please, these drugs, what are they? She said, please, they're your routine drugs. Don't teach me my work. No, and I didn't want to. Honestly, mama, I didn't want to teach her work because I'm not a nurse. I've never been pregnant before. So when she shouted at me like that, I just carried my medicine, and I went. Go home, drank it, and I started bleeding. <laughs> mama, eight years. I started bleeding. I went back to the hospital. They say, oh, madam, is stressing the abortion. What did you take? I showed the doctor. The doctor opens my file and says, shows on my case file like this, boldly on the, on the top of the file, something like this, you know, something like this. They wrote boldly here, the drugs I was allergic to, and that drug was one of them. And this overzealous nurse gave me these drugs. I even insulted me on top of it. That's why I stayed bleed. They were not telling me, ma, you have to take this injection. You have to do this. You have to lie down. You can't move. You can't. Mama, I learned faith the raw way. You know when you are, you know, when, this is why I always tell people, I don't have a problem with you going for prayer. But you can't build your life on another man's prayer. I don't care who it is. You run from pillar to post looking for who to pray for you. The day there's real problem. <laughs> Mama, the day there's real problem, you know now, Mama. You know that is, you know those times when it's just you and God inside the room. And you don't know where the kata is coming, whether it's kata or water, water from you. You don't even know. You are everywhere. There's sweat, there's kata, there's tears. You don't even know how it's doing you. That's how I was. I was like, <laughs> this would even understand. The nurse was still talking to me. Then she says to me, uh -uh, because I was staring into space and I was hearing God. He was saying to me, look at me, look at me. So I was looking. He was saying, see yourself, see yourself, see yourself dancing forward with your baby. See yourself. So I was carrying my, my, I could see my mind's eye dancing forward with uh, my baby. And people were behind me. Dancing. So I was imagining, so the nurse says to me, matron, well, the elderly woman, my mama, she says to me, ah, madam, are you okay? <laughs> mama, I'm not doing like this. <laughs> madam, with all due respect, are you okay? She said, eh? I said, ma, are you okay? Eight years. This thing you're telling me, eight years. I said, baby that I've dedicated. I said, give me one my injection i'm not even coming here you just give me all my injection they give me my five days injection i said i will look for the doctor that will give me they just give me i go home i told my husband i said they say it's threatened miscarriage i thank god he's even threatened because if this if satan can do something he won't threaten me i said but this baby i've dedicated this baby my husband said okay you go to america you have the baby i go to america Mama. that one it was even a faith journey Reverend Lori Dausa just called me. She came for a meeting or something, came for one of our meetings and said, Oh, do you have where you're going to in America? I have a house, I have a car, you can stay there, it's empty. That's how I got free everything. Oh, God there. Had my so I was did my baby was supposed to come September eleventh. September eleventh uh was planned because I'm also a September baby, so I was very excited. My baby's gonna be September like me and all that. <laughs> Two weeks to that and no. Vida was born 36 weeks, so that's four weeks. So a month before that, we went out to do something with Dasa. And then the hospital starts calling me because I went for antenatal two days before. They start calling me. I need to come into the hospital. I had pre there. I didn't know. They needed to rush me. I, Mama, you know, it's not like Nigeria. They say, your husband should sign. If I don't speak English, they rode me to the theater. They brought out my baby. <laughs> that one in itself was a miracle. I came home to nigeria with my baby everything was fine january 5th 2015 i woke up in the morning oh my husband i'm feeling so mal. he said ah, what's wrong i said i don't know i'm feeling so mal. this piece go and do tests my husband said go and do tests i said oh, is that how they every january 5th is that how they used to get pregnant i beg leave me lo and behold mama i was eight weeks i was eight weeks gone i didn't know eight weeks pregnant for my second child this is me that they said i would never have babies i didn't even, i didn't even know when I go pregnant. <laughs> then they now started. Your placenta is not working. Your blood pressure is one thing. You had they were just talking plain plain English. I was in church one day and they had I don't test. They said they want to take the baby out. So I was telling God that they should not they said the decision will not even be yours. In fact Nigeria is very funny. Ma Nigeria is funny. They said the decision will not be yours. In case that in a case where they need to save you or the baby, they will ask your husband. It's not for me. <laughs> I said they will not ask my husband. I know he will choose. I say they will, he will not get to that. So I got to church that the husband was preaching, and he was just talking, was shouting. I couldn't, but I was thinking, you know how you are in the service and you are hearing voices behind you. And I was saying, Holy Spirit, I, 
this is not adding enough. I can't lose. You said there are two nations. I can't lose baby because doctor was telling me, hey, we'll take this one out. We have another one. I said, oh, doctor, it's not like that. Too. I know how these babies come. And God said there are two. There's only two remaining. Mama. My husband was supposed to say, listen. I just looked up. My husband was shouting, the incorruptible seed of the word. It's the incorruptible seed of the word. It's the incorruptible. Ah. This said to me, listen, listen. How did you get this baby? I said the word. He said the word is incorruptible. It cannot be spoiled. This word is forever. Nothing can be taken from it. Nothing can be added to it. I just said that's it. The source of the thing is the sustenance. This baby can never be taken out. Mama, I went back to the hospital. They said to me, oh, your placenta is working just fine. I don't know what that other test was doing, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, and you're having a chairman. That's how I knew I was having a boy. They said, oh, you're having a chairman. Congratulations, ma. That's how I went to America. I had David that came home. Mama, case closed. Three children, closed door like I don't even talk again. I don't, <laughs> not say anything. I don't. But one thing that God taught me on that journey, because I said to him, it could have been easy for me to just go and do IVF. It could have been easy, but you insisted. Because every time I go to the hospital, God will say, this is not the path. This is not the way. I want you to stay on the world. He now said, more than our people who cannot afford IVF. I want you to learn this so that you can teach it. Mama, that's how we started Hannah's Heart Ministry. Anna's had, I can't even count. We've had triplets, we've had quadruplets, we've had twins, we've had most, like, I can't even begin to count the amount of babies we've had. And not that I go and lay hands on people. We teach them the word and we teach them how to pray the right way. So you get your victory. There's something sweet about it that I walked this journey with God and this is the result. So everything that God has had me do, I have had to learn it. This year's conference, Friends, and I will end with this because Baba, you made me talk for one and a half hours. <laughs> I will end with this one man conference. It's a conference that is coming up September 11th to 17th, and that's one mama we invited you for. And I, and I know we didn't get a chance to tell you why we invited you, so I'm going to tell you here publicly why I invited you. So, this conference initially was supposed to have this conference in 2018, and God said to me, It's not time. We had announced it. We had even announced 2018. Just as this conference is going to be wow, man. God said, I didn't send you that one. You are the one that is excited because I said, wow, man. Seasons. Child seasons. So I said, I'm sorry, Lord. Okay. When you are ready, we'll be ready. So we, 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 we moved this thing around. I think we even invited. I think we had even sent you an invitation. Was it this one? Or 20? No, no, no. It was 20. So we moved it. We moved it to 20, to last year. or supposed to last year again. Then I didn't send out invitations. I sent your invitation out. I said, so when eventually we couldn't do it, I didn't know how to now come back and say, you're not doing it. I'm not saying, hey, God, mama did not ask me, so she has forgotten. Maybe she never remembered I invited her. So I just kept quiet. I said, I will not say anything. When you now sent me, I said that. You now come and I said, oh, my darling, I, my baby my just told me now that I have him. I'm with you this week. I say, hey. I said, my mama, my knees, ma. Mama, my knees. <laughs> I said, I'm kneeling down, ma. Should I raise up my hand? Should I my hand? You're like, Oh, no, 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 it's not a problem. I say, eh? I dropped the phone. I say, I'm too young. Ah, God, I'm too young. I can't be offending mothers. I'm too young. I got them and me. I say, Papa, Papa, ah, you're my father. Come and help me today. He said, ah, what's going on? I say, ah. I say, she said, it's okay. I know it's okay, but I'm not okay. He said, he not said, I'm saying, I know you. I say, ah, Papa, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. Please help me. He not said, I'm, I'll call her. She said, it's okay. I will call her. I say, ah, Papa, call her. Until I hear you come back and tell me it's okay. I'm not okay. You're not called. So you're not called back. I said, I'm going to, I'm going to beat you. Why will you go and call Reverend Abbas on me? I'm going to beat you. I've told you it's okay. I said, Mama, it's not okay. I dropped the phone. I called my hospitality team. I said, How do we send apology? Come and send gifts to, uh, uh, to, to Mama. They were just laughing at me. Hey, Pastor M. She, she said, It's okay. I said, It's not okay. I'm not okay. She said, It's okay. Me, I'm not okay. <laughs> so eventually, God not told me the reason why he said it was not time. He wanted me to use those five years to walk the journey because wow man is actually an acronym for the five areas that a woman must master because before she can become a wow version of herself. So the first one is womanhood, W. You must master who you are as a woman, the purpose, the power, what God called you to be and how to take care of yourself as a woman so that you can preserve the power that God has placed inside you because we will work and serve other people, take care of children, take care of husband, take care of everybody, take, but you cannot rest. And we even take pride in the fact that, ah, 
I'm so busy. <laughs> you will busy yourself to a grave. And the people that are not supposed to benefit from you will no longer benefit from you. So God said you must help them to understand it and to nurture that womanhood and to take pride in it. There's power in being a woman. It's such a beautiful thing. Then O is ordination. We talks about your ministry. Every woman is called to do great things for God. You may not be preaching you know, on a pulpit, but your pulpit is anywhere you pull people out of a pit. So wherever as you find yourself, that assignment will help you. So O is ordination. The second W is wife. As a wife, there's something you're called to do. And every woman carries the grace to be the wife to the husband that they're sent to. Then M is mentoring. We can't do this without the right mentors. There are people we must follow and there are people we must pour into. So God said, I needed to give you time to learn from people and to be also be able to teach people and to look back and say, oh, these are the people that have followed me and they are now doing great things as well. It's not just about you. It's about legacy. Then A is affluence. Money. As a woman, you must have your own money. You must make your own money. You must learn how to multiply. You must understand that money must not have power over you. You must be able to, money must, money must be a tool to you to do God's work, to bless yourself. There's, there's money for sowing seed, but there's also money for enjoyment. There's money for doing business, but there's money for enjoyment. You must have multiple streams of income. You can't, can you be a woman? You can't do anything for yourself. You want to buy pad, you go to your husband. You want to do this. So affluence is A. And then N is natural. You must be a natural motherhood. Every woman is called to be a mother. Whether to mother your own natural children or to be a mother to spiritual children or to be a mother because the things that are happening around us it takes a it takes a village to raise a child and that is changing everybody's going to mind their business now and that's why things are deteriorating when i was growing up there are aunties that would pull my ear before my mother comes home the aunties that would tell you this is nonsense don't do it again in your life and so that's what wow man is and so when we we had people for, we have people speaking on every day um the first day where Christy Batura is there the day of ordination, Pastor Nketiene, wife, we have two people, Daniel and um, Karima, mentoring. I have four of my mentees who are going to be speaking. Then affluence, we have um, Ayo, um, Auntie Ayo. Then N is nurture and motherhood. So we have um, Tinu Asegeme and Pastor Chiomai Besim. So we have the complete wild man. But for the last day, which is the dinner, the award night, the final, the grand finale, God said he wanted us to bring someone who was an epitome of all. Who we needed to give people a believable reference. Someone who has ticked all these boxes. If you talk about a woman who is confident in being a woman, confident in her power as a woman, understanding her full purpose as a woman, FFA is the woman to go with. Uh, if you're talking about a woman who understands her calling, her ordination, of course, even from case the woman to go with. If you're talking about who understands her role as a wife, I've heard you say that if your husband does not fulfill his assignment, God should hold you responsible. That's the that is depth in what it means to be a wife. If it's mentoring, you have mentored millions of women all over the world. If it's affluence. We know how many businesses you run, how many things you do, and then nurture. If there's anyone that we can call a mother, even in the kingdom, a mother definitely is you. So the whole thing, God wanted me to give people someone that they can see and they can recognize. So that's why we decided, even though the full wild man is complete, so on the seventh day, we will now bring it all together and say, okay, this is, the, this is one woman who has done this also. If, we, if she can't do it, then we too can do it and so that's the real reason why we want you to do the last day of course that day we also be giving awards to a few people but it's it's really my own journey god has brought me to this point and god has really been faithful it has been him all the way in six weeks god has pressed me i've been writing books i'm bringing out six books that's taking me six weeks to write mama it's been i don't even know i'm doing it honestly but god has been faithful to be honest and so the, that's all the journey is just is just going to culminate on that day so i'm looking forward to that week you know i'm really looking forward to that week <laughs> wow i seen wow mildred what you are the wow man <laughs> what a nice i think this is the first time <laughs> 
with our for three minutes and nobody <laughs> is I. I. what a blessing what a gift of god you are so grateful thank you so so very much for being so vulnerable tonight thank you only eternity will reveal how much of a blessing you are in. Amen. thank you thank, thank you, you. Lord, in the Amen. Amen. and i want to thank all of you every tuesday thousands of you you know from all around the world remember this will be on my instagram page and then i'll move it to youtube to save it so that many other people please give my regards and my greetings of honor hey to pk himself what <laughs> eyes were just popping out wow thank you thank you pastor mildred thank you it will bless you life yes Lord. to be a part of the team that god has laid on Thank you. Friends, well done, beautiful queen. Everyone, I appreciate you all. And good night and have a blessed and fantastic night in Jesus' name. Thank you again, PM. Thank you, Ma. <laughs> Thank you. Ma.